This is The Camp with Zach Heilprin and the Athletics' Jesse Temple. Yes, welcome into The Camp. I'm Zach Heilprin. As you can see or maybe hear, no Jesse Temple with me. He'll be back on Monday. This is a special episode of The Camp, a start of a special episodes of The Camp, uh, a series of four episodes looking back at the 1993 Badgers from four different perspectives. I had an opportunity to catch up with four different people that experienced the team and year in different ways. One media member, one member of the football administration, uh, one player, and then a pretty famous coach. Uh, I had an opportunity to chat with them here over the last week or so. Uh, This is the 30th anniversary uh, of that team, a team that among people of a certain age, and I am of that certain age, is the most beloved in program history, not just for what they did that year, but what they've meant to the uh, last 30 years of Wisconsin football. I mean, I lived through it again. It was just 12. So I had a little, probably a little bit different experience than uh, maybe those uh, in college and, and older as they got to experience all the things that go into Wisconsin football that maybe a 12 year old does not. I think you understand what I'm saying, uh, but the season was remarkable. The Rose bowl remains my favorite game I've ever been at. So with all that said, let's get to today's interview. Again, this is the first of four episodes uh, that we're going to be releasing every other day over the next week as we close in on the start of fall camp for the Badgers. Up first, a well-known face and voice in Madison. It is former Channel 27 and former Channel 3 sports director Jay Wilson. Hope you enjoy our conversation. And we do welcome in Jay Wilson, former Sports director at uh, Channel Three and at Channel Twenty Seven. Uh, you were at Twenty Seven in night uh, when this whole thing came about, right? In nineteen ninety three, you were you were at tw- Channel Twenty Seven. That's correct. In fact, the 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 Rose Bowl that year, the ninety four Rose Bowl, was on Channel Twenty Seven. So it was to this day, I think it's the most watched program in Madison television history because we did some research at the time and. Uh, of all the TV sets that were on in Madison, it's believed that 90% of them were watching the Rose Bowl. That's and, insane. And that's a number you just don't get. That's insane. Um, so I'm starting all of these interviews with, with the same question. Um, how bad was it when Barry Alvarez showed up in 1990? How bad were things for the Wisconsin football program before he showed up in 1990? Uh unbelievably bad uh i remember the last home game of the don morton era was against michigan state uh at channel 27 that day we didn't even stay for post-game interview uh the the north end zone where the student section is uh was all all you could see were aluminum bleachers there were twenty nine thousand, i think that attended that game but everybody was so down on the program because Don Morton, who, who was a really nice guy, but just was not suited for that situation. He ran the Veer offense, and I shouldn't even say the word Veer because it gets people so mad if you even bring it up. But it was, it, was a, it was a situation where he didn't have great players, he didn't have a great scheme, he didn't have great ideas, and uh, it, was, it was just time for a change. People were just so hungry for a change because it, it wasn't – it wasn't that people were angry. They just didn't care, which I think in that situation might be worse. Yeah. Apathy, I think, is is worse than not caring. Apathy is definitely yeah. worse than not – than. Oh, excuse me. Uh, yeah. Apathy is definitely worse than being upset, yeah. right? Like you, you, you want people to be upset. Yeah. You could walk in on game day outside of the stadium, and people would take their extra tickets and just stick them on the wall, and you could walk up and get a ticket just by – wanting to go in the stadium, which is unheard of nowadays. Right. So still to this day, it, well, I guess we'll see with the new, the new era. We'll see if it's still part of this, but in their entrance video, Barry's presser is still a big part of it. It's because of the famous quote, it's, you know, mm-hmm. better get your season tickets now because before long you won't be able to, what was the feeling for the media there? Because I, we, we are a cynical bunch and uh, we, uh, <laughs> We, we hear those things, and sometimes we roll our eyes. What were the feelings for the media as a media member when you hear that, that type of thing? Can I say swear words on this? You sure can. Well, I, I, I'll, I won't say it, but you can tell. 
most everybody thought he was full of <laughs> it starts with it starts with an S. Yeah. But but one thing about Alvarez, when, when he walked in, again, people were so hungry for success at that point. When he walked in to the facility for the news conference, he turned heads. And to this day, Alvarez can walk into a room and he's a head turner, you know, just by his presence. And so I guess that was the first clue that maybe something would be different. But, you know, again, coming coming from where it was, and again, his his first three years weren't great. I mean, he was one and ten first year, five and six, five and six. And people were starting to go, this guy sold us a bill of goods. I can still get tickets. But it's funny how that line in that video you mentioned still brings a roar from the crowd because I don't know if he absolutely believed it when he said it, but it sure turned out that way. It definitely did. And you're you're right. Those first three years weren't great, but you could see signs of progress, right? Like one in 10, there's, there's not a ton of progress. And I, the, the BTN did a, the, the 1993 big 10 elite, right? The, the Wisconsin mm-hmm. elite show. And, and Barry has talked about it before. Like he would have an outward, as you said, outward presence where people would believe everything that he was saying. And he was so confident. And then they would, they went one in 10, they get their butt kicked. And he was so confident in front of his team that it was, you know, everything's going to work out. Everything's going to be fine. And then he would go behind the scenes and curl up in a little ball in his office and, and be like, <laughs> Oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? But there were, there were signs of progress, maybe not that first year, but then you go five and six and 91, you go five and six and 92 and you beat Ohio state who I believe was ranked 12th in the country. That was the, the first big win. I'm wondering for you, when you're thinking when, in that three-year period, could you see the changes and could you see some optimism growing about what the program could be? Yeah, because again, it was it was in such a, a deep hole. Um, but I, I don't I don't think you could have seen the Rose Bowl year coming. Uh, yes, signs of progress. I mean, you know, Troy Vincent. Right. Help turn everything around. I mean, that 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 was very clear when a guy like Troy Vincent bought in that that was certainly a great sign. Um, and again, the, the Rose Bowl team wasn't star studded. I don't think you can say, you know, a couple of guys got drafted uh, that year off that team. But but you look up and down their roster and you, you go, oh, that's a nice player. He's a good player. But it was it was just a group of players that went like that. And um yeah, yeah, you could see that it was improving, but to get over that big hump, I don't, I, you know, I, I certainly didn't see that. Right. So, end of '92, they're five and five. They're going into Northwestern. They beat mm-hmm. Northwestern. They're going to a bowl game for the first time, I believe, since 1984. It would be a huge thing, right? And they driving down the field potentially to kick a field goal to win the game or to tie the game. I think it was to win the game, and. Mm-hmm. Jason Burns fumbles. Yep. I remember listening. So my point of view for this entire thing is as a 12 year old. Um, But it is also a view that is very, I remember everything. And I remember sitting in a, in a a bedroom at my house downstairs, listening to it on the radio. It wasn't on TV. So I was listening to the radio and just, I think I started crying after that. Like they're going to a bowl game and then they're not going to bowl game. Do you think, what happened the year before they were so close in 92 to get to that bowl game. It kind of served as a little bit of motivation in that off season. Yeah. I mean, it, it didn't hurt. I know that um, the difference between your upbringing and my upbringing, I, I didn't listen to games after halftime because they were getting <laughs> killed so bad. So it's good that you listened to the end of the game, but um, that, that stung boy, there is no question that stung. And, I don't know that they verbalized it in, in, in our interactions with the media that next year, but you can tell that that stuck, that that burned. And if they were ever in that type of situation again, they were just not going to let that happen. And I think that that says something about the makeup, the, the, the psychology of that team is that, you know, they remember the past. They felt, I think, that it was heading in the right direction, and and now this was their time to really head it in the right direction, and they, and they managed to pull it off. So, I went back and was when I was doing some research for this because again, your your childhood is always just messed up. Like it doesn't, it, it's not how it actually was, right? <laughs> so I had to go back and look it up. And you, you talk about expectations. 
And I think they were in one top 25 poll in the, in going into the 1993 season. It was a Chicago tribune and, and everyone's like, what the hell? How, why? Um, and mm-hmm. there were, <laughs> there were some uh, things in the paper, the Wisconsin state journal and, and talking about potential bowl games where they could potentially go. And um, you know, they had Michigan, Penn state, Ohio state, Iowa, and Illinois, all ranked ahead of Wisconsin, just in terms of like where they could potentially go in the bowl. I've never seen bowl predictions. Like we see it now you're predicting where mm-hmm. they're going to go, but like, this was like, this is what's going to happen. Here's this, here's that. And uh, it, Wisconsin was a little bit of an afterthought going into that season, despite, you know, having built a little bit up. What were your expectations? If you remember going into that season? Yeah. I, again, I, I, I would agree with that observation. I, I thought they were a fringe bowl team that, that could make a bowl. And again, making a bowl for Wisconsin at that point was, was like, Oh my gosh, let's, let's close all the shops and take the rest <laughs> of the day off kind of stuff. But, you know, again, fr- fringe bowl. And, and there weren't as many bowls then as there were now. So there were fewer opportunities. Um, you, you could, I mean, I, I thought they'd be a, a nice team, a competitive team, a fun team, but to, to accomplish what they did, I, that wasn't on my radar at all. Because again, I, you know, I'm dealing with the past when, you know, Billy Merrick would run for 250 yards and they get beat 34 to seven, you know, that kind of stuff. So it, it was just, it was just unreal to think for, for a kid growing up in Wisconsin that that was possible. So uh, the other aspect of it was like, what are some of the questions on this team going into the season? And, you know, in retrospect, it's like, Really? Because one of the biggest questions was quarterback. Uh, Daryl mm-hmm. Bevel was not an established player at that point. He was a, a sophomore, redshirt sophomore, like a 50-year-old redshirt sophomore, but still a redshirt sophomore. Um, and the, the, there were some questions about, like, if they don't, if they have the quarterback, maybe something can be better than it was. And they go ahead and they open up the season going 3-0 and um, mm-hmm. to, to get the season started. And, off, you know, it was... Well- it wasn't like there were any big teams, right? It was like, it yeah. was, uh, what was it? Uh, Iowa state and yeah. Nevada. The SMU, the SMU game, that yes. game at SMU was huge. Uh, they came from behind late and it, it would be was, interesting if they didn't win that game, which way the season would have turned. Cause instead of three and all you're two and one, blah, 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 you know, but, but, but they managed to pull it off. And I think that really, that really helped them the rest of the year. Yeah. So that's another game I listened to on the radio and like at oh. halftime, they were down in, in, at halftime in that yeah. game, they were down and it was a, uh, like all the promise, all the expectations. It's like, is this really going to happen to them or, or are they legit? And I think that they showed themselves that they were legit and coming back and they got a late interception in that game to, to seal it. I think it was, it might've been Scott Nelson that got the interception and you sealed it and you're two and O you go and beat Iowa state the following week. You're three and O heading into big 10 play. Was there a feeling that, Oh, this is, this is different. Oh yeah. Uh, no doubt. Uh, in, in fact, uh, a, a fairly famous interview, Joe, somebody was, some reporter was asking Joe Panos. If the, I think that at that time of the season, so who's going to win the Big Ten, Ohio State or Michigan? And Panos looked at the guy and said, why not Wisconsin? And I think many people in that locker room, you know, Panos was, Panos was one of the real leaders of that group. And he's going, why can't we do it? And I think other guys looked around the locker room, after, especially after that SMU win, and went, yeah, why not? And – you know, again, it all came together with the stars aligned and then that sort of thing. But, but uh, the confidence just grew. I, you know, after that three and all start, the confidence just grew and, and, and never really left them. Was there a buildup media wise too? Because like nowadays when Wisconsin is good, all of a sudden we see the Milwaukee people coming in and we all, we see the, the Matt, the uh, green Bay people flowing mm-hmm. in. Like you don't usually like when they're in, in 2018, where they were really, really highly ranked going in, then they were not very good. People stop showing up like uh, Madison media is there all the time, but mm-hmm. it's when you get the other people from around the state coming in. Was it, was that yeah. kind of the feeling? Uh, I, I don't remember an overwhelming uh, present when, 
when when they got to Michigan, when they got to Ohio State, yeah, it built up a little bit. I mean, three of the three and zero start was nice, but it wasn't like here we go. But you know, and, and again, this is you know, thirty years ago, media was a whole lot different. I mean, you know, there were a lot of one o'clock kickoffs. Yes, some not on TV, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, yep. and more more eleven o'clocks and not a whole lot of primetime deals. For this team, yeah. So I, they were always like 105, right? Like it was a it was a 10, yeah. 105 kick, and the only time you could see it was in the the replay at ten o'clock. Yeah. What was it on? Uh, on W eight on the the public TV, yeah. WHA yeah, in Madison. Van Stout and uh, yeah, and right? Al Dussman, I think was on there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah. like that's how you watched a lot of games, and actually that's yeah. before before DVR and before like you were recording everything. If you went to the game, you'd come home, you get home at like 10, yeah. 10 30, and, you're, and that's that's your rewatching of the game. You don't have a YouTube to go back and watch it. But so they go to Indiana, they win at Indiana, then they go and beat mm-hmm. Northwestern, uh, hammer Northwestern, and then they come mm-hmm. and, and go to Purdue and win. And they're three and zero in Big Ten play for the first time in a really, really long time. Yeah. And then they go to Minnesota and played their worst game of the year. Daryl Bevel yep. throws for, I believe it was, it's still a school record, threw for over 400 yards. Also threw five interceptions. Five interceptions, yeah. That was the frustrating part is that, you know, because Bevel, Bevel protected the ball. I mean, that, that's one thing he would do. You know, it, game manager was a term, is a term that's thrown around a lot now. Uh, he might have invented the term back in the 90s. <laughs> I mean, you know, he, he had some ability. I mean, he, he was a good quarterback in Northern Arizona when he played for his dad. But, you know, he had limitations. But that game, you know, it, it, as enthusiastic as everybody was after that great start, everybody started going, oh, here we go again. again. Same old, right? Yeah. Same and, old values. And, you know, and, and playing the Metrodome, you know, it didn't matter what kind of team Minnesota had. That that place, they blew it up, thankfully, for Wisconsin <laughs> fans because it's no longer there. But that, that was a really tough place to play. I mean, now, and, and for that game, Minnesota had that one circled. I mean, they – they put everything they had into that game and the, the crowd that day was so loud. Uh, very, uh, very much a minute pro Minnesota crowd. And um, uh, that, that was a real wake up deal. Like we're not there yet. We thought we were making progress and we are making progress, but we're not there yet. And the fact that they were able to uh, survive that loss and still accomplish what they accomplished is, is pretty remarkable too. And I feel like it had to help, though, that the next week was Michigan, a team mm-hmm. they hadn't beaten since 1981, a team they had beaten just twice since 1962. This is, mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's 30 years, twice in 30 years. And it, this isn't like the Big Ten of uh, that it is now where you don't play a team, you know, for, for long stretches, right? You're playing them mm-hmm. almost every single year. And it had been such a long time. So they come Halloween weekend in Madison, so I'm pretty sure it was an 11 o'clock game uh, because I was unable to make it because I had a football yeah. game this morning and was un- unable to make it. Oh, shit. Sure. Yeah. So, I, so, cool. but uh, Michigan, Michigan wasn't some great team. They were projected to be the, the big 10 winner. Right. But they weren't like, I think they're ranked 24th in the country uh, coming to that game. It was not a pretty game by any stretch, but it was a, it was a Barry Alvarez game, man. It was yeah. a very, it was a pound it. And then play defense. They get they they swarm defensively, but as like, do you remember how big that game was going in? Yeah, uh, they weren't a great Michigan team, but they were still Michigan. Right, they still uh, had the wing helmets, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Go, uh, go back to that 1981 game just to show you how things have changed in the media. Michigan came into Camp Randall ranked number one in the country. The game was not televised <laughs> at all. It was a one o'clock start, so. Our local, I worked for Channel 27, a local affiliate here. We shoot the game on our videotape, and ABC in New York calls us at 3.30 in the afternoon saying, we need highlights of this Michigan-Wisconsin game. So back then, to get video from Madison to New York was like this maze of connections you had to make. And so that was the only way they would get number one-ranked Michigan losing to this doormat Wisconsin program. <laughs> Back in 1981, but yeah. but I I digress. But um, beating Michigan was still that was such a huge mountain 
there were so many t- games. If you look at the scores through the years when Michigan played Wisconsin before this, or be- between the 81 game and that, I mean, there were some real blowouts. I mean, I remember being a local reporter trying to come up with a storyline when you lose 56 to nothing. <laughs> and, and man, it was hard. It was really hard because we, we traveled to the games in Ann Arbor and we, we knew what was going to happen before it happened. But this, but this one, especially after what happened in Minnesota, this is another kind of, kind of came out of the blue, but again, it was a team that had, had great confidence in itself. And despite the disappointment of Minnesota, they managed to do it. Who were the leaders on that team? Who were the guys that you went to when you needed a quote or you wanted to, you know, um, Mm -hmm. hear how the, how the locker room was feeling? Who were some of those guys? Uh, Panos. I think Panos was the first guy. Um, Brent Moss wasn't wasn't a great interview. So, you know, and, and Bevel was good, but he had a little Russell Wilson in him where he wasn't going to give you a whole lot other than, you know, line 45 or right. 6, you know, that kind of stuff. But, you know, I mean, they were all good fellows they were they were good to work with i'm, I'm looking at the roster uh uh you know the linemen were pretty good linemen are always underrated interviews where they they'll, they'll give you some decent stuff defensively um eric underzat was pretty pretty talkative kenny gales was the, the mouthpiece i mean he that dude he liked cameras all the time I, and i don't know if he was trying to get attention away from everybody else just to you know so they could do their deal. But uh, Kenny Gales was a confident young fellow. And, uh, uh, you know, in that, in that Rose Bowl, he, he had J.J. Stokes one-on-one a lot of times. And Stokes only caught 14 passes. Only. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it was a team of personalities, but not personalities like we think of today. They weren't on TikTok. They weren't, they weren't doing Instagram things. They weren't NIL guys. They were just a bunch of hardworking guys who, you know, you asked them a question, they gave you an answer, and it, it wasn't controversial. It wasn't stop the presses. They were, they were all decent fellows. But, again, it was, a, it was a group that just fit. Their personalities fit so well. They, you know, Panos would kick guys in the butt, but they'd respond. You know, that, that kind of thing. So there were a lot of, there were a lot of guys like that. So they beat Michigan 13 to 10. And this goes to the talk about some of the good guys, the crowd, the stampede in the student section after the Michigan game. I mean, you got some uh, pulseless non-breathers and you have, was it, was it Michael Bryn? Mm-hmm. You know, saving, Save, saving lives, saving lives after this. Um, did what happened after the game kind of uh, just overtake the game itself? Was it? Would you? Or how did how did that play out yeah. media wise? Yeah. Uh, well, I, just to give you my perspective, I I was shooting highlights on the field. Game ends. Crowd rushes the field, and it's the only time in my life I've ever been caught in a crowd. And on the field, the crowd was so big. I remember being lifted off my feet with my camera and my feet aren't touching the ground. Wow. And that, and it was scary. I mean, I've never been in a situation like that. And that was on the field. I was on about the 40 yard. Line. And then all of a sudden Jack Ray, the PA announcer makes that famous pulse of non breather thing. And you're like, Holy crap, this is, this is for real. And so I worked my way down to where the fence had collapsed and, and and you know kids are the students are crying and 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 they don't they don't know what's going on and it, it was so unfortunate that what should what should have been the the highlight the greatest part of that whole regular season turned into such tragedy and you know for days people were just shaking their head going how in the world can this happen and uh, you know I mean who, who could have who could have known that would have happened now now they treat crowd things much differently they a lot of times they'll just let people go uh, they, they've certainly beefed up the the uh, infrastructure and, yeah and made that less of a possibility right but you know it, it was a chain link fence you know 
And if, if you've got hundreds of people pushing down the chain link fence, that, that, that's no match. And it was tragic. I mean, it, it's, it's fortunate there were, it, it could have been a whole lot worse, let's put it that way. But yeah, it, it definitely put a dark cloud, dark cloud on that day, no question. Thankfully, obviously, no one died. Um, yeah. We we know that, and um, I remember the again for the Big Ten Elite story that these guys went into the hospital. The players went to the hospital and visited some of the people that were injured, and all they were talking about was beat Ohio State, go beat Ohio State because that was the next game the following Saturday. What a what a two week stretch for Wisconsin mm-hmm. football. You get you know Michigan at home, and then you get Ohio State the following week. And this wasn't the Ohio State that we know now, um, but it, you know it was mm-hmm. John Cooper's Ohio State. Uh, usually underachieving, but it's still Ohio State, and they had some. They had some guys. They had some dudes, namely Joey Galloway, uh, mm-hmm. that, that uh, really stands out. Game goes back and forth. Joey Galloway catches a late touchdown to take the to to tie the game at fourteen. Wisconsin goes right back down the field, and Rich Schnetsky, the mm-hmm. walk on from uh, uh, from the Milwaukee area, maybe it was Mequon. Um, mm-hmm. Either way, he gets out there. It's a field goal to win it. To essentially, they would they they would have their way with it, right? They they win that game and they are in their own control of their own destiny. They go they go win their next couple games and they're in the Rose Bowl, and it gets blocked. And Ohio State's going crazy, like they won the game, and Wisconsin's like so close, so close. What what was the feeling like after that one? Among the players, you think it, it it was awfully deflating because you win that boy, you're you're in the penthouse. I, I remember the snow was coming down. It, it, was, it, it was a beautiful scene. I mean, the it was amazing. Were coming down and it was fantastic, right? Because they used to have to bring in the so they so now they have enough lights to actually be able to light up the stadium at night. Right. Back then they did not. Back then no. they had to, ABC had to bring in these portable lights and they would be on the um, east side of the stadium across from the press box now where there are obviously suites, but before that it would be like two big lights hanging over. I, I remember it vividly, vividly. And yeah, the snow was coming down just, just towards the end of that game. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Field goal kicking was not a strength of that uh, 93, 94 club. That's for sure. And uh, don't ask coach Alvarez what he thinks about field goal kickers in general, by the way, <laughs> right. <laughs> he'll, give you, he'll give you a colorful answer on that one most of the time. But um yeah, I mean, in this season of, of, of remarkable ups and downs, you, you just beat Michigan and then you have the crowd, crowd crush. You're on the precipice of beating Ohio State. I mean, you know, look at the records of Wisconsin versus Ohio State. You know, as you looked at Wisconsin versus Michigan earlier, and you know, the scores were pretty similar. They were a lot of times 56 nothing. Yeah. So, so to get that close, but again, do the math, the tie doesn't kill you. Right. And, and that was – that was something that after the disappointment of the field goal, people went, hey, the math still could work here. And it did. And it did because the following week, Wisconsin goes to Illinois, takes care of the, uh, the Illini, and then in, uh, in Michigan, the Wolverines beat Ohio State. And all of, a sudden it yeah. puts, it all of a sudden it puts Wisconsin back in control. But it's control, and they have to go to Tokyo. To, yeah. <laughs> to finish this thing off two weeks later, uh, the game was December 4th. The game was only set up that way, or it was in, it was supposed to be a home game. Can you imagine what that would have been like? Oh my at, gosh. At Camp Randall, no it would have been amazing. It would have been just completely at a different level. Instead, it's in Tokyo because it was going to serve as like an extra bowl game. Like it was going to serve as their bowl game because it wasn't, they never got to go to bowls. So it was going to be, it was kind of serving as their bowl game, but they go to Michigan mm-hmm. State. They just need to win it. Did you go to Tokyo? You know what? Uh, the, the price the price was too high for uh, <laughs> Channel Twenty Seven in Madison. The only Madison station that went was Channel Three, Van Stout, because they had the uh, the coaches show. Yeah. So and they, and they had to. Right. And they so, had to. And our people thought about it, but it's like, man, I mean, you know, that's who was all, back then. It's probably five thousand dollars, and our guys our guys weren't real interested. And we went, you know, they could go to the Rose Bowl for the first time in a really long time. But uh, I don't think uh, – well, finances are still a big part of uh, when you can travel in broadcasting. So yes. that, that, yeah. that part hasn't changed. But, yeah, it was, it was a little disappointing we couldn't go. But, uh, you know, it was a late game. It was a late start. 
you wouldn't get a lot of bang for the buck out of the coverage, even though so many of those images are iconic with guys with roses in their mouths and that sort of thing. But, you know, maybe next time in 600 years, right. it happens again. <laughs> so, they, so they beat Michigan State 41-20. They're going to the Rose yeah. Bowl. Uh, they they get back. It must have been the, I mean, State Street obviously went crazy. Mm-hmm. Did, you guys, did you guys go and film any of that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was it was a late night, I'll tell you that. And uh, one thing I will give Wisconsin people, whether it's basketball or football, when their teams succeed, uh, Alvarez always had a line. Whoever's going to celebrate can only tie me. <laughs> and I and I think that was the case for a lot of people because, again, for all the ups and downs, to actually have it achieved, you know, ni- 1963. I mean, most everybody on campus wasn't born then, and. Uh, to, to have that accomplishment was, was just fantastic. Yeah. So they go to the Rose bowl. They are, mm-hmm. they're out in Pasadena. Um, was there, we drove out as a family. We drove out, mm-hmm. it took like a week to get out there, stopped about a bunch of different places, but it felt like the entire state was there. It felt yep. like the entire state was there. And I, and you know, there was all these different things, whether it was the the pep rally in the the plaza, whether it was the uh, the band playing on Santa Monica Pier or all these different things that that happened there. It was a, a true, true experience that so many people got an opportunity to take part in and did, as you mentioned, did not, you know, allow itself to to go un, uh, unparty, I guess. So there was there was no it was good to be a party. And it, it yeah. turned into a huge party that entire week. There were two things I never thought I'd see in my lifetime. Wisconsin going to the Rose Bowl and Wisconsin going to the Final Four in basketball. And both both of them actually happened. Uh, you know, like you say, there were so many Wisconsin people out there. It's too bad they all couldn't get tickets. Right. Remember the ticket issue? I mean, there were so many ticket issues and problems. and and uh, But but. When the when game day came, I think it was seventy five twenty five Wisconsin, probably. It was, it was electric. It was, yeah. I mean, it, it was electric, and I, you know, when you when you, I remember walking up that tunnel, and when you looked out, and I and I I'm, I can't imagine what it looked like for a player coming out of that tunnel, but walking up that tunnel and just seeing all that red, just yeah. chills. Yeah, the uh, you know I. I was in television, been in television for over 40 years, and people will say, what's what's the, the big moment? And the big moment for me is Wisconsin coming out of the tunnel mid-afternoon in Southern California. The mountains, you know, the sun is hitting the mountains in the background. It's a perfect day. Temperatures in the low 70s. It was just a marvelous afternoon. And here comes, here comes your Wisconsin Badgers coming out of the tunnel. It's like, this can't be true. This can't be happening. But it, but it did, and it was. I mean, even even earlier in the week, we had a chance to go in, inside the Rose Bowl to, just to just to look at it, things like that, just to see Wisconsin's name in the end zone at the Rose Bowl was something. And was, and I'm sure so many people have those kind of memories. Yeah, they, they they and they're so they're great memories. The game itself is a little sloppy if you're if you're talking if mm-hmm. UCLA. They turned the ball over six times. Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. Uh, Brent Moss ran him down, had 153 yards, couple of couple of touchdowns. Um, Daryl Bevel with the uh, the most amazing run in <laughs> football history um, was was there. I assume were you on the field for the game shooting? I was. Yeah, yeah. Back back then, you could get your whole family on the field. Basically, I mean, you know, pre 9 11, credentials were handed out like candy. You know, yeah. And so uh, so yeah, so I was I was down on the field, and. Uh, that's that's an experience I wish everybody could have too. Yeah. Uh, so Bevel uh, Bevel scores. UCLA is coming down the field. It, it's looking like they. I mean, it's twenty one sixteen. They need a touchdown. JJ Stokes unstoppable. Kenny Gales tried his best, but it just wasn't happening. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Wayne Cook he was sick most of the week. If if you if uh, and I think that maybe gets forgotten at times. He wasn't a bad quarterback, mm-hmm. but he was sick. Mm-hmm. And just made the most boneheaded play you could probably ever make at a football game, um, not knowing time and time and yeah. down, down in time, time and uh, the situation. He runs. They have no timeouts. Clock ticks down to zero. You can hear the crowd. Two, one. Mm-hmm. And then all hell breaks loose with celebration. Your memories from that. Yeah. Well, uh, two things. Uh, during the week, 
we have a lot of interview sessions. And during the week, the Madison media, you know, we talk amongst ourselves and we, we all had the feeling that UCLA was kind of assuming they were going to win. They had, they had this air about them that the, the, the city slickers from Hollywood were going to show these corn fed guys from the Midwest a thing or two. And, um, and I think Wisconsin had a constant, I, I, I always had the sense that Wisconsin players felt that too. That, that hard work, sticking to the plan, sticking to what we've done, how we've gone about it, we've been through so much. I, I, I really think they had a psychological advantage. And I, and I might be guessing here, but I think that last play kind of showed some of that where UCLA is like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, we might not win this, we might not win it. And all of a sudden the clock's kicking down and, and, it, and it's all over. And so, uh, so that, was, that was a part of it. The, uh, my perspective on those final seconds, I wasn't on the field. We had a post-game show to get ready for at Channel 27 because again, this is the most watched program in Madison television history on ABC. And we go right to our post-game show after that, so I'm positioned outside of the Badger locker room, and I'm hearing the crowd going five, four, three. I'm like, boy, it sure would be great to be out there and see all this. But you know, you have responsibilities, and as the sports director, I had to host the post game show. So uh, the post game show starts, and I, I don't have a monitor; I'm not able to see anything. But I'm I'm describing the highlights of the game that have been edited back in Madison, and the producer back in Madison is going next for the next highlight. So I have to time whatever I'm saying fairly close to when this highlight allegedly ends. Anyway, I, I'm getting through the highlights and I'm getting near the end of the highlights and, it, and I'm going, boy, when these highlights are done, I've got nothing. Because you know we don't have phones that have stats, live stats on. So I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what am I gonna talk about until we've got some interview that can run from the field to the truck? Well, fortunately, I had a pretty good relationship with Coach Alvarez that has developed, had developed through the years. And as I'm doing the last highlight, who comes walking down the tunnel right by our broadcast location but Coach Alvarez? And I turn around and I say, Coach Alvarez, we're live in Madison because I don't know what Coach Alvarez would say if he doesn't know we're on live TV <laughs> <laughs> because he is, this, he is walking on air, no question. And he's like, Hey, Jay, sure, glad, glad to do it. And so I've got the first local live interview with Barry Alvarez after the Rose Bowl, despite missing all the celebration there. And so, you know, again, huge audience, Badgers win the Rose Bowl. I'm talking to Barry Alvarez. It, it worked out pretty well. Sounds like it did. It sounds like it yeah. did. Yeah. Um, I've, actually, <laughs> I've actually seen that, that clip a bunch of times. We, had, we did have a... a vcr copy of it and it was the channel 27 version of it so okay yeah. I, i've seen that and like because we we were out there didn't get to see any of the post game stuff right like it, yeah we went home and i think florida state was playing somebody and so like the highlight was that like there was very little very few highlights of it so being able to come back and, yeah. and watch that was was great and it is yeah. it, it's just amazing that the timing yeah. right was that on vhs or beta did you record it <laughs> you <laughs> You TV people use beta, right? It wasn't that it wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. We went beta and then beta went away. Yeah. Every, so all everyone else just people. <laughs> yeah. Everyone else went VCR and, and TV went beta. So, yep. um, but no, it, it just an incredible scene. The post game was incredible. Um, when you think about what that team had meant to this program and it really the last 30 years, would you, I don't know if you would agree with this, it's the golden age of Wisconsin football, right? Easily. Yep. Uh, that jump started it. What is the legacy, do you think, of that 93 team and the, the 94 Rose Bowl? Uh, unparalleled. Uh, Luke Fickle hasn't coached the game here, but he can draw on what the 93-94 the Rose Bowl team did. Because, again, as, as you mentioned, they weren't a ranked football team. They didn't. They weren't star studded. They uh, they weren't the kind of team that went on the road and and feared the the opponent that was at home. They they squeaked out a win at SMU, 
that if it doesn't go their way, who knows what direction the season goes. They, they suffer one of the more disappointing losses to Minnesota because b- based on what was in front of them, to go to Minnesota and lay an egg like that, man, that was, that was just awful. Um, to, to beat Michigan, then have the disappointment of Ohio State. And then, you know, and, and again, this team tied for the Big Ten title. Six one and one with Ohio State, but Ohio State was a more recent visitor. The rule was the more recent visitor to the Rose Bowl game, the other team went. So right. Wisconsin 63, Ohio State was more recent, 86, 87, something in there. Um, that got Wisconsin there. So all these things had to come together. All these things had to come into place. Um, and it did. So if, if you're a Wisconsin player or coach current day, you can tell that story when, when times are good, when times are bad. When times are good, times could go bad really quickly, but you can still get through it and you can still achieve the highest, uh, the highest uh, accomplishments a team can have. Just a remarkable year, a remarkable team, and a team that I think is probably as beloved as any in program history. Um, it's, you know, it's not the back-to-back Rolls Bowls of 98, you know, the, the 98 and 99 teams, not the three straight, though they didn't win a Rolls Bowl in those three straight, yeah. but it's, it's, it's not that, but it's the original, like it's, it's the original. They hadn't won a Rolls Bowl before that. Yeah. It'd been how long since they had won a big 10 title. Like right. I, I, I personally, I mean, it's, it's a childhood memory. So yes, I, I've kind of, I may, might be a little biased, but the most beloved team in, in, in uh program history and i don't think mm-hmm. it's particularly close or should be particularly close yeah. i think that's fair um it's funny uh we, you know again I, I come from my we covered the team very closely standpoint that first rose bowl covering that first rose bowl was so energetic so exciting so thrilling when they went to three in a row in the late 90s by that third rose bowl we hated the rose bowl <laughs> it was like oh my gosh we got to go through this again and you know you think about being in that situation in the late 90s back in, in 94 it's like no no i will always love the rose bowl but it was like oh here we go for another week and a half in pasadena <laughs> so it's funny <laughs> it's funny how how things flip but i i think you're right i i think the legacy of that team and uh i i still uh, do some broadcasting with scott nelson and uh, he always tells the story of he was embarrassed to wear his letter jacket around town in the early 90s because of what Wisconsin football was. And um, he, he speaks so warmly about the players he played with on that team. And again, not a, not a cast of, of five-star recruits, not a cast of high NFL draft picks, but a team that figured it out that didn't let adversity turn everything negative and, and ended up winning the Rose Bowl. Unbelievable. Yeah. And, and so many of those guys showed up at the same time Barry did and grew along with, went through those growing pains mm-hmm. to get to the other side and get to the, the high end of, uh, of what was the high end of college football at that point, going to the Rose Bowl, winning mm-hmm. the Rose Bowl, winning the big 10. That's as good as you could have ever hoped. I mean, yeah. they don't lose to Minnesota. Maybe they're, Maybe they're national champs. Yeah, I don't know. yeah. Um, and, but... and and what one other thing about that that team and that that era, the, the assistant coaches that <laughs> that were also there. I mean, you know, Bill Callahan coached the Oakland Raiders in the Super Bowl. Yeah. Uh, Jim Hoover and John Palermo, boy, they they swore like sailors. But I'll tell you what, they they knew football. Brad Childress, the offensive coordinator, was uh, head coach of the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, Dan McCartney went on to a the defensive coordinator went on to a couple of other. Uh, uh, head coaching positions in college and and you know I, I don't know if that's a a bit of an untold story but but they might not have had five-star recruits but I think they had a lot of five-star assistant coaches as well and Alvarez Alvarez is the CEO I mean he just knew how to do it I mean you know if I'm if I'm a referee and Alvarez is coming at me to challenge something I usually go yes you're right coach I, <laughs> Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He he can be an intimidating presence. There's no it point. is. He can be. Hey, Jay, I, I really appreciate your time. Um, it's it's such a fun year to look back on, and uh, I I love it from the media perspective because I'm because now I have that perspective, and it's you, you certainly do look mm-hmm. at it differently. When they went to the Rose Bowl in 2019, that was the first one I got actually got to cover. Um, it 
it is a special place. Um, and I just can't imagine, you know, you have you going from 90 to 93 and just like just the complete gulf and change of how the program was viewed and, and how important, uh, not important the job was, but just how much more, how many more eyes were on it and how exciting the period was. I, I do appreciate your time. Uh, Dak, I enjoyed it. And uh, it, again, it's in 40 years of broadcasting, it's the greatest memory I have, the 94 champion Rose Bowl team. All right, there he was, Jay Wilson. Really appreciate him joining and giving his perspective. Coming up Friday, former Wisconsin linebacker Chris Hine. We're also going to be talking with former sports information director Steve Malchow in episode three and closing out the only way we can with former Wisconsin coach and athletic director Barry Alvarez. If you're listening to this, please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. If you're watching this, we certainly would appreciate you subscribing to the YouTube as well. All right, until next time, you've been listening to The Camp.